Welcome everybody. Today we're going to run our first set of spatial regression models in R. And today we're going to do the four simplest versions. We're going to start with OLS, which is a non-spatial model. So y equals x beta plus epsilon, where we're assuming this epsilon is just a normal stochastic error term, a lot of slopes, a lot of x's here. We're going to run the spatially lagged x model after we test this OLS model a couple of different ways to see if there might be some spatial relationships that we should be accounting for. The spatially lagged x model adds the average value of the neighboring x's. So for example, if we were explaining crime rates, if that was our y, our x's might involve things like income, education, unemployment rates, things that we might think have something to do with crime rates. In the spatially lagged x model, we don't only include our own crime rates in education, we also include the values of our neighboring regions, education and income and unemployment rates. The idea here being that maybe neighboring unemployment rates, if that affects crime in their area, those same people might come here if they're unemployed or are desperate and commit crimes in our region. Second model, the spatial lag model, sometimes called a SAR model, although Roger Bivend complains about that. He says that SAR should not stand for spatial autoregressive, which we use in econometrics. Sometimes we'll call the spatial lag model a SAR model. He says that should stand for simultaneous autoregressive only, not spatial autoregressive. Since this is a common term, the SAR model, I'm going to include it here, although know that some people will take offense at using SAR to mean this model. And in this model, we do not have the spatially lagged X's, we have spatially lagged Y's. So rho, W, Y. Here the idea would be that if there are higher crime rates in neighboring areas, maybe that also affects our crime rate. Maybe some of this crime going on in our neighboring areas spills over into our area. This is a global spatial model, whereas the spatially lagged X model is a local spatial model. Local meaning these X values of our neighbors, they affect us, but that's it. It stops there. There's no global spillover effect where our neighbor's values affect us and then that also affects our neighbors and that affects our neighbors and so on and so on. With the spatial lag model, this is a global model where anything that happens to our neighbor's Y both affects us and then that has a feedback effect both to the original neighbors and beyond so that every region in this network feels some kind of effect. So like a stone being dropped in the pond, this ripple goes on forever. In a spatial error model, what we envision as being the thing that spills over is the residual. So here our value of the residual, the unexplained value, is a function not only of our unexplained stochastic error term, but also it's a function of our neighbor's residual values. One interpretation here is that there's some missing variable that is spatially correlated. So perhaps there's some explanatory variable that we have not put in the model that is causing our residual to be high. So maybe we leave out unemployment as a variable in our model, but unemployment rates are spatially related. So there tend to be clusters of a variable that we haven't included that will lead there to be a spatially related unexplained clusters of high values of the residual higher than expected crime rates in a region, and then maybe lower than expected crime rates in another set of regions in kind of a spatially localized area. Now, this SEM or spatial error model is also a global model in the sense that if there is a shock, if there is a high residual in one area, then that will ripple through all of the regions in our model. So let's go into R and let's actually 
do this. Before we do that though, let me show you something I've been working on here that's included in our download for today. This is a first rough version, I'm calling it version 0.5, of the mother of all our spatial econometrics handouts, where I list a lot of the commands that you might need to read in weights, create weights, we talked about that in a previous video, and how to estimate various models. Again, today we're going through these first four models that we just talked about. In later videos, we'll get into some of these more complicated videos that are on this side, and also on the back, the SARR and the SARMA. Let's help you get going. You want to follow along, and so that you can follow along, here's what you need to do. I'll include a link in the description of the video below, or you can go to my website, spatial.berkeyacademy.com, click on GIS and Spatial Stats, and you can find the file here under Link to File Downloads, or Spatial Regression 1.zip. And inside that zip file, once you download it and you unzip it, you will find the cheat sheet that I mentioned, at least the current version, a description of the variables in the data set, a shape file that has both the maps and the data that we'll be working with that we created in an earlier video, a neighbor file, a gal file that we created in Jota, in case you want to practice reading that in, we did that in a previous video, and here are our commands for the day in a text file. So here's what I want you to do. You need to install R and R Studio. I have links on my spatial web page if you want to easily find those and download those. Install R, then install R Studio if you haven't. Open R Studio, and when you get to R Studio, I have these instructions in our text file that I showed you there. So just open up that text file, it shows you the link and extract it to a directory, open our studio, and here are the next steps we want to do. Go to File, New Project. So we're creating a new RStudio project. Click Existing Directory, and then we want to select that directory that you downloaded and extracted, that zip file. So that R Spatial Regression 1, and let's create a new session, Create Project. And so once our studio opens, you see those files that are in that directory over here on the right. Now the next thing we want to do is to go to File, New File, R Script. And that opens a little window down on the bottom here where we can copy and paste all of our commands from this text file. So if you want to, you can just go ahead and select everything, copy it, and paste it down here. What that lets us do is edit these commands and run these commands without any trouble. Now, if this is your first time running any kind of spatial regression stuff in R, you're going to want to run these three commands right here, which will install the packages spdep, rgdao, and rgeos. If you've already got them installed, you can skip that. What you want to do next is you want to load in the data set from the shape file in there. And so just go to this line here, library rgdao. We need to load that library. Click run over here. Then click this run again. And this reads in that shape file. Click run again. This just shows us the names of the variables in that shape file. And then click run again. And that shows us a, some summary statistics of the data in that shape file along with the names. Now, one problem that you're going to run into in R quite often, so we might as well cover this, is some of these variables, the quantitative variables, what you're looking for is that they have a minimum, a median, mean, and a maximum. That means that R is treating these as quantitative variables. However, here's one that we're interested in, PCI, which is per capita income, and instead of seeing the min and the mean, you see a frequency distribution. That means that R is treating these as qualitative or categorical variables, and you have to fix that. I have a little command here that you can use to fix that. Just put the, the name of the data set, which we've named SPAT data, SPAT.data, and the name of the variable, PCI, per capita income. And then this command over here will convert that, resave it as a quantitative variable. So click Run. And if you want to verify that that has worked, we can go back up to this summary line here and click Run. 
and go back up to that per capita income variable and now you can see that it's giving us minimums and means and maximums and these are in US dollars. All right the next thing we want to do is you might want to create a map of some of your variables so click run and this is going to make a map of the sales per capita of liquor little map over here now there are a lot of ways you can customize this but that's not the point of this video maybe we'll do that later if you guys want me to go through how to do that now let's load the spdep library so just click run on that line and the spdep library is the one that contains most of the spatial statistics commands that we're going to be using so first thing we're going to do is we are going to take the data set that has the map in it that we're looking at over here and we're going to create a queen neighbor file or a version of that W matrix the spatial weights matrix that tells us who are neighbors to whom click on the end of the line and click run and now let's create a rook weights matrix just in case you wanted to now in order to use these matrices there are a lot of different ways that R stores them one is called a neighbor NB another is called a list W Whenever you want to use these matrices for most kinds of spatial regressions, you're going to want the list W version. You convert them with this little command NB to list W. So just click on the end of the line, run, run, and that just saves a new version of them. And you see as we create new objects, they're listed over here in this values column over here. Now, the one we're going to use in these regressions, just to make it easier, so we don't have to type this queen.listw every time. I'm going to just kind of rename it, save it to another name, listw1. If we wanted to use the rook, we could just replace the word queen here with the rook, and it would use that one. This just makes it easier to switch between the weights matrices if you wanted to play with that. Similarly, so we don't have to type our regression equation every time. Let's just name it. Here's the equation. We're What we're going to be doing here is using... An equation to explain the DUI rate, driving under the influence of alcohol, explained by the liquor sales per capita, college enrollment percent, so what percentage of people in this county are college students, the distance between where people live, neighborhoods or block groups, to the closest ABC store, what percentage of people are Baptists, why, because historically they are anti-alcohol, let's we'll see if that has any impact. The distance between where people live and the closest bar where they could buy a mixed drink. So a mixed drink is like orange juice and vodka. And what percentage of people in that county work in the entertainment and recreation industries? These might be tourist areas. So let's define that equation. And one other thing I'm going to do before we get going is turn off scientific notation. This seven basically says, don't use scientific notation to represent a number unless it's going to have like more than seven zeros before the digit, or if it's a larger number, like uh, seven billion or something like that. Seven is a reasonable value. You can play with this. The larger the number, the more reluctant R will be to use scientific notation. Helps us see what our results are a little easier. And run. Okay. Let's do OLS first. So just LM, our regression equation, tell it the name of the data set, run, and let's look at those results. So we have one barely statistically significant variable here, Baptists. So the more Baptists, the more driving under the influence there is. Okay. And we have an R squared of about 0.058. Not too great. Okay, let's see if there's any residual spatial dependence in our residuals. So what this does is this is a Moran's correlation test designed for regression residuals. You can't use a regular Moran's correlation. It won't give you the right results. So this lm.moran test looks at the residuals of that OLS regression, and then you give it what kind of spatial relationship matrix you want it to use. This is the queen that we had. And click at the end here, click run. So the null hypothesis is no spatial correlation in the residuals. And this p-value is very small. So we're going to reject that. This is telling us that there's something funny spatially going on in our residuals. Maybe we should investigate some kind of spatial model. 
Now, another way to see if we might want to run a spatial model, just looking at the OLS, are to do these Lagrange multiplier tests we mentioned in a previous video when we were looking at Geoda. Let's run these tests in R. Here's the command. Well, good grief. The documentation says that you can just say test equals all and it'll run all the tests. I guess we'll got to go back to the old version of this, which is you have to do a list of all the five Lagrange multiplier tests that you want it to do here. So let's try this. I'll include this new command in the text file that you download. This output here is testing to see how much would our model improve if we ran a spatial error model. p-value suggests that a spatial error model would improve the fit. This test here looks to see if a spatial lag model. Well, that suggests a spatial lag model would improve the fit. This is the robust Lagrange multiplier error test. This is seeing if an error model would improve the fit but trying to filter out some of the false positives because a lag model can be a false positive for an error and vice versa because they do have some similarities in their data generating structure. So this is suggesting maybe an error model. Same thing for the lag. So what are we to do? Well, speaking with Luke Anselin many years ago, he suggests picking the one with the lower p-value. So this one has a lower p-value. Luke Anselin would suggest the lag model. Now we have a fifth test here for the SARMA model. Now as far as I am able to tell, number one, R is not capable of running this SARMA model. Number two, this was Luke Anselin's idea to run this test, and Luke Anselin suggests that the SARMA model is probably not ever the right model. He suggests running this test for completeness. So Luke Anselin's idea would say, let's look at the lag. So now let's run the SLX model, spatially lagged X's, where again, we're just taking basically the average values of our X's and throwing them in to see if they explain our value for arrests for drunk driving. So what we get are two sets of slope coefficients, one for our own X's here, we'll call those the betas normally, and then we have WX theta, so T for theta, these thetas are a set of slopes for each of those explanatory variables, and they're going to tell us how our neighboring values of explanatory variables affect our values. So there's two ways to do this. One is there's a command in SPDEP, LMSLX, we can run, so let's do that. All right, now let's look and see what it gives us here. So summary, reg2, click run. So as you can see, we have two sets. Here's the first set. These are the X's, and these are the lag X's. So basically how you would interpret these, let's find a couple that are statistically significant here. Okay, so here's one that says, this is the distance between neighborhoods, block groups where people live, and the nearest place where they could buy a drink in a bar. If that distance is higher where we live, this leads to a lower amount of drunk driving arrests significant at the 0.05 level here. So that's our own value. So if in our county the distance is higher, there are lower drunk driving arrests. However, if we look at the value in our neighbor's region, if the value, the distance between where people live in the neighboring county and bars is higher in the neighboring county, that kind of leads to a higher drunk driving value in our county. Now, I'm not saying that this model makes sense. We're just throwing some variables together to see what happens here. But it kind of gives you this interesting thing that can happen with an SLX model, is that that variable has a positive value for one of the two. For In this case, it's, it's a negative for our own value, our own distance, but a positive for the other one. So this makes you think, what's the best policy that you should have? Should you try to make this distance higher by restricting the number of bars, or should you not? Well, there are two offsetting effects. It lowers, if you make this distance higher, it lowers drunk driving arrests in the own county, but it tends to increase drunk driving arrests in the neighboring county, if we can believe these results, and if this is the correct model. Okay, this goes with a lot of caveats. 
but interesting result. So this kind of makes you think that, well, since there are these offsetting effects, what's the overall policy effect? What if in this entire region we put in a policy to restrict the number of bars to make this distance higher, what would the total effect? So we'd call this the direct effect, and this is the indirect effect. What would the total effect of this be? Well, there's a command that we can run here to help us out. So here's the command. If you want to figure out what would the marginal effects be when you really have to take the spatial nature of what's going on here into account, the fact that there are the direct and indirect effects, you can look at these coefficients here and they are the marginal effects. But if you're interested in what if every region increased the distance, what would the overall impact be on drunk driving arrests? We need to use this impacts command and you tell it what the weights matrix is. So let's run that. So this gives us the direct effects, which are just those coefficients, like the 0.0154, that comes right from here, 0.0154. And the indirect effect, the 0.02649 of sales per capita, just comes from here, 0.02649. But then we can look at the total effect, 0.0419. So basically what they're doing here in this case is they're just adding those two together. Now when you have one positive and one negative, so this negative one, this positive, here's the total effect. But here's where it gets interesting. What if you wanted to know whether that total effect is statistically significant? Then you need to make your impacts command a little more complicated. So here is the more complicated command. You have to do a summary of the impacts and tell it z stats equals true. This R here tells how many simulation repetitions you need. When you're looking at an SLX model, you actually don't need that. It's gonna be ignored in this case, but later on when we do this for the lag Y, you have to tell it how many repetitions you want because it is truly simulated, but in this case, they are directly calculated. Let's run this command. Click in here, run, and so it not, not only in this case lists the total effects, it calculates the standard errors for the total effects and the Z values for the total effects and the P values for the total effects. Why this is important is you might have two effects, the direct and the indirect, that are both statistically insignificant, but then it could turn out that for the total effect, that is statistically significant. And that's what we saw for sales per capita, if I'm not mistaken. The direct effect was statistically insignificant. The indirect was statistically insignificant. But when you look at the total, well, I, I guess I'm sorry, I'm wrong here. That direct effect is 0.06, so not quite. But it could be that the total, when you calculate the Z stats and the P values for that, it could be statistically significant. Here we see the direct effect is statistically significant, but negative. The indirect, statistically significant and positive. And the total is also statistically significant. And that total impact, this one was negative, this was positive, the total is positive. What this tells us is, if we instituted a policy that increased the distance to liquor stores everywhere, it would have an increase overall effect in drunk driving arrests, assuming we can trust this model and it's correctly specified and all that, right? Okay, let's move on. Here I have some code. If you wanted to try running an SLX model and doing it kind of by hand without trying that, let me just point out one thing that I noticed when I did this, you can try this yourself, is when you run this, and let me note here that you can run a spatially lagged X model just using simple OLS. It doesn't require any kind of fancy maximum likelihood estimation or anything like that. The only really good reason why you'd want to run this with a spatial package is to do these direct, indirect, and total effects here and to get those p-values calculated correctly. But you can run the SLX model if you just wanted to by hand calculate those average values for your neighbors. I show you the commands here to do that. So it's create WX command basically. And then you can run just a regular simple OLS. What I found that's confusing, and I have to ask some people about this, is I got different R squared values. 
Let me show you side by side those results. So here are the two results side by side. So this is using spdep, that command we just ran. If you run it more or less by hand, calculating those average values, you get exactly the same coefficient estimates and exactly the same p-values and standard errors and everything. The same residual standard error. The big difference here is that the R squared is much higher here using spdep, much lower using OLS for some reason. And for some reason, we also get a different value of degrees of freedom for our F stat here. 13 and 221 here, 12 and 221 here, and different p-value for our F statistic. The R squared here is much higher using SPDEPS, SLX estimation, compared to using OLS. So let's figure out which of these two is right, if either one of them are right. So let me go through, just run these commands that did that by hand. So run, creating the lagged variables, creating a data set, running that regression using OLS. And here we see that lower R squared. So let's calculate the R squared by hand here and see. So when we calculate it by hand by doing one minus the sum of squared residuals over the total sum of squares, we get the 0.1539, which that's the same thing OLS is giving us, which makes me wonder why this high multiple R squared in the SLX. I'm going to have to ask around about that and see if that might be a bug in the SLX estimation procedure here. We'll try to track that down and get back to you. Well, due to the magic of making videos, here it is a few days later, and I got it figured out. We found a bug. And I say we because I would not have found out this bug if I wasn't making this video for you. So I guess you deserve a little bit of the credit as well. So you got to witness the process of finding a bug. Try something, do it a different way. If the answers don't match, probably something strange is going on. So here is my name. Sorry, I couldn't list all of your names as I don't. I don't know who you are, but here's my name enshrined in the R code. So I reported the bug to Roger Bivend, and a day later he created a fix for the SPDEP package. It is January 2018. As I record this, the bug fix won't immediately be found in SPDEP if you download it today, but very soon, within the next few weeks or maybe months, the fix will roll out to those packages. So maybe whenever you do this along with this video, you will get the right answer all along. Okay, enough of that. Let's go and run these other two models. So let's run the SAR model, although, as I said, Roger Bivend does not like calling it. He says SAR should stand for simultaneous autoregressive instead of spatial autoregressive. So let's call it the spatial lag model. And that's where it has the lag wise. Here's the command lag sarlm, etc. Let's run it and let's look at what it gives us. Summary, reg3, and run that. So here it gives us this row. So it gives us one slope estimate plus this row. And remember that row is this spatial lag parameter here. So it tells us to what degree do our neighbor's values of y affect our own value of y. And do they affect us in a positive way or a negative way? And here we see a positive 0.398, and that is statistically significant. Now, here's the rub. When you estimate a spatial lag model, you can't look at these slope estimates and interpret them as marginal effects. Why not? Well, it's because of this global feedback effect. Whenever we change something in our own region, like sales per capita, of alcohol, that not only affects our Y, but when our Y goes up, it affects our neighbor's Y, and when our neighbor's Y goes up, it affects our Y. Again, there's this infinite feedback. Don't look at these slope estimates, and don't look at these to see if they're statistically significant. It's nonsense. What you have to do here is run that impacts command. So let's do that. We already did the impacts for regression two. Let's skip down here to regression three, which is that lag y. And if we just run this, it tells us the direct, indirect, and total effects. So the direct effect 
if we were to increase our own sales per capita by one, what would happen to our arrest rate for DUI? This is if all of our neighbors change their sales per capita, how would it affect ours? This indirect effect can also be interpreted as if we increased our own sales per capita, what's the total impact on all of our neighbors? And then this is the total effect, kind of the direct and the indirect, both going back and forth, what's the total? Now, you also want to run this next version here with the R in it and the Z stats equals true to see which of these impacts are statistically significant run that. This takes a few seconds because it's doing a lot of simulations to calculate these. Now one warning while we're waiting for these to come back. Caution. I've noticed when you run these simulations multiple times, this is simulating 500. If we were to simulate these another 500 times, we're going to get different Z stats and p-values. Run them another 500 times, you get different Z stats and p-values. Even if you crank this up to 5,000 times, each time you do these simulations, there's a lot of variance there. So here we see these p-values for the direct, indirect, and total effects. This one is 0.07. If we were to run this again, whether it's 500 or 5,000 times, this p-value could be 0.02 or 0.03, or it could go up to 0.11 or 0.15. I've seen a lot of variability here, so be cautious. Not only might you want to choose a high repetition value here for these simulations, you might want to run these simulations multiple times just to get some confidence that what you're seeing here is stable. So that's the lag model. Let's go to the spatial error model and run it and look at a summary of reg four here. And here we're going to get an estimate for this lambda parameter. And the lambda parameter here is positive 0.4. And that's this lambda right here that tells us if there is a stochastic shock to our neighbors, how does it affect the value of our stochastic error term? And we get a statistically significant value. Now, unlike the spatial lag model, you can look at these estimates and you can interpret these as marginal effects because the only thing that's happening here is involving the residual terms. Now there is an interesting test. We'll come back to this and we'll look at a test that I think it was Pace and Lesage have a paper where theoretically since all we're seeing here with a spatial error model, theoretically if all we have is this spatial relationship in our errors, it's a kind of spatial autocorrelation problem. Or you could think about it as a spatial heteroscedasticity. I know, I'm weird in saying that, but in any case, the residuals are non-spherical, non-random. All right, there's one last thing we need to do, and then we're going to wrap this video up, and that is a spatial Halsman test. So let me show you the paper so this is a paper in Economics Letters by Kelly Pace and Jim Lesage, where they developed this spatial Hausman test. Now, what is a spatial Hausman test, you might be asking yourself. Well, in order to understand a spatial Hausman test, you really need to understand a Hausman test. If you haven't ever read, well, when I say read, I really mean flip through this paper by Jerry Hausman in November 1978. Please get a copy of this paper and read through the first couple of pages at least. I mean, I know whenever I start reading the real theory here and the proofs, my eyes start to glaze over as well. But this is a brilliant paper that is Nobel Prize worthy. Most of us are familiar with the Hausman test in the panel data sense of the Hausman test. But really what Jerry Hausman's paper here says is that, look, if you've got two choices between models in the panel data case, but this is general, he generalizes it to all kinds of cases, but in a panel data model, you can either include fixed effects, or if you don't include fixed effects, the problem is those fixed effects might be correlated with the variables you include, and if you don't include the fixed effects, it will cause bias. So 
the Hausman test for panel data is testing to see if I leave out those fixed effects parameters, does it look like it biases the other coefficients? So it's looking to see if the coefficient estimates for the panel data model without the fixed effects, sometimes called a random effects model, and the model with the fixed effects, are those parameter estimates very close? If so, perhaps we're not biasing the parameters too much, but we're gaining efficiency by leaving out those fixed effects. A spatial Hausman test, on the other hand, is looking at comparing the estimates of two models. Model number one is OLS, model number two is the spatial error model. Now the spatial error model, if the model you're estimating is a spatial error model, then since the structure of the spatial noise is just in that residual term, that is a kind of spatial heteroscedasticity or spatial autocorrelation, which Theoretically, if it's true that you're estimating a spatial error model, that should not bias the parameters if you estimate it with OLS. The big benefit from estimating a spatial error model is that your standard errors will be estimated correctly. What this spatial Hausman test does is it compares the parameters estimating a model with OLS to the parameters you get if you estimate it using a spatial error model, and the parameter estimates should not be too different. If they are, this is a sign. Let me show you the quote. For a given set of variables, a divergence between the coefficient estimates from a spatial error model and OLS suggests that neither is yielding regression parameter estimates matching the underlying parameters in the data generating process. This calls into question use of either OLS or SEM for that set of variables. So what Lesage and Pace are saying here is if this spatial Hausman test detects a significant difference in the parameter estimates between the OLS and the spatial error model, maybe neither of those two models are correct. In the spatial world, maybe this is telling us that we do have some spatial dependence in our model just a spatial error model is not the right way to capture the spatial results. So for this spatial error model that we just ran, again, we had this lambda parameter that was highly statistically significant, and we've had some other models and tests that suggest that there is some spatial relationship in this data that we're modeling here. Let's see if this Hausman test suggests that maybe the spatial error model is not the proper way to capture it. So let's run that. And here the Hausman test, since the p-value is 0.057, if we were using an alpha of 0.05, then we would say, you know, this p-value is a little bit higher, so we cannot reject the null hypothesis just based on this, that the spatial error model could be the right one. But if we were using a p-value a little more lenient, like a 0.1, we might reject the null hypothesis, and we might use this as evidence to say that neither OLS nor a spatial error model are the right model to be estimating these coefficients. There's enough difference to say that perhaps we should explore another model. Now, of course, there are a lot of other reasons to explore other spatial and non-spatial models to approach this data. Of course, number one is, what does your intuition say should be the right model? We have covered four models here in this video, OLS, SLX, spatial lag, and the spatial error model. In the next video, we will cover some of the more complicated spatial models, and perhaps we will get some intuition from those tests and those results that one of those models fits this data on drinking and driving arrest rates better than what we've done so far. So 
I'm going to call it quits for this video. I hope you have learned a lot, and I hope that if you have any questions about what we've done so far, that you will contact me. Please leave a question or comment in the comment section below. Please like this video if you found it informative. Please subscribe for more, and I look forward to meeting with you next time where we build on our results here and explore some more spatial models. Berkey Academy signing out. Bye-bye now.